Hi everyone, this video is part five of the 1B series on sleep and sensation from the biological basis of behavior unit for AP psychology students. This video lesson focuses on the sensations of touch, taste, and smell, as well as the vestibular and kinesthetic sense. This video will finish all of the remaining content from the category of sensation. And as you can see from this outline, sensation is the last topic of unit one. So this video will mark the end of biological basis of behavior. These are the key focus questions that will cover the content of today's video. This will give you an outline of the major themes. By the end of the video, you should be able to answer each one of them. These are the essential concepts that are related to the sensory systems that are covered in today's video lesson. By the end, you should be able to define and describe them. In the previous two videos on sensation, I covered the topics of sight and hearing. The College Board gives a little more detail to these two senses as far as theories and important concepts, so I spent more time explaining the eye and sight and the ear and hearing. In this final video, I will explain the remaining sensory systems. These include taste, smell, and touch, as well as the vestibular sense and the kinesthetic sense. Together, these make up the seven sensory systems that detect information from our environment. So first, let's start with the chemical senses. We have two chemical senses that detect molecules in our environment. This happens in our nose and in our mouth. The olfactory system is responsible for our sense of smell. This involves inhaling air through the nostrils where odor molecules enter the nasal cavity and dissolve in the mucus lining that is in the olfactory epithelium. This is a specialized tissue that contains 20 million olfactory receptor neurons that detect these chemical molecules. They convert the chemical into an electrical signal through a process called transduction. These signals travel to the olfactory bulb, which sits just below the brain and above the nasal cavity. And then those messages are sent straight to the olfactory cortex in the limbic system. This is the only sensation that bypasses the thalamus for faster processing. This direct pathway allows for faster, more immediate processing of smell, which can trigger strong emotional memories and emotional responses. Pheromones are a key concept in understanding smell. These are chemical signals that are released by animals, including humans. Pheromones can subconsciously affect behavior and physical states of others in the same species. They play a role in communication like mating and social interaction, as well as territorial marking. Pheromones are detected by the vomer nasal organ, which is in the nasal cavity, and this can influence behavior and hormonal responses without our direct awareness. The next chemical sense is gustation. Gustation is our sense of taste. But before outlining the process of taste, let's talk about the substances that we put in our mouths in which we can detect taste. So we've identified six different distinguishable flavors that humans can detect. The first is sweetness, and sweetness is usually associated with the presence of sugars and certain proteins. Sweetness is often an indication of energy-rich foods. Examples of sweetness include honey, fruits like apples, apples and bananas, candies and desserts like cakes and cookies. Next is sour. Sourness is caused by acidic compounds. Sourness often indicates the presence of vitamin C. Sour tastes can also signal a sign of spoilage in some cases. Examples of foods containing sourness includes lemons, limes, vinegars, and yogurt. Next is bitterness. Bitterness is detected by a wide range of compounds and often serves as a warning sign for poisons and toxins in nature. Some examples of bitterness are dark chocolate, coffee, kale, and Brussels sprouts. Then there's salty. Saltiness is primarily detected through the presence of sodium ions. Salt is essential for the body's maintenance of electrolyte balance. Examples are table salt, soy sauce, and salty foods like nuts and pretzels. Next is umami. Umami is often described as savory or having a meat-like taste. Umami is detected through the presence of glutamates and nucleotides, indicating protein-rich foods. Examples of umami foods are Parmesan cheese, soy sauce, tomatoes, and mushrooms. The final flavor is oleogustus, which refers to the taste of fats. It's recognized by detecting fatty acids and is believed to signal energy-dense foods. Examples of oleogustus foods are olive oil, butter, nuts, and fatty fish like salmon. Each of these taste categories helps us identify and enjoy a variety of foods, but more importantly, 
taste helps organisms identify nutritious and safe foods while avoiding harmful substances. So now let me outline the process of gustation. The gustatory system consists of the tongue, taste buds, and nerves that send that information to the brain. This process begins in the mouth where there are specialized structures called taste buds that pick up and detect taste. Taste buds are actually located within the papillae, which are small bumps on the tongue. Each taste bud contains receptor cells that respond to different chemical molecules. When food molecules bind with those taste receptors, those taste receptors convert that information into electrical signals, which is a process you know called transduction. These electrical signals are sent through nerves to the brainstem up to the thalamus, which as you know, is the sensory relay station. Then that information is sent to the frontal and temporal lobes to be processed as taste. This is the gustatory system. Now, some people are more sensitive to taste than others. We've identified three types of taste sensitivity. There are super tasters, medium tasters, and non-tasters. Super tasters have a heightened sensitivity to taste and they experience flavors more intensely than others. They tend to find certain foods, especially those that are bitter, extremely strong and sometimes unpleasant. This group of people is more likely to avoid foods like dark green vegetables, coffee, and certain alcoholic beverages due to their intense taste experiences. This heightened sensitivity due, is due to the number of taste buds on the tongue. Medium tasters have an average number of taste buds and moderate sensitivity to taste, and they fall between super tasters and non-tasters in their ability to perceive different flavors. They can enjoy a wide range of foods without the extreme taste sensitivity that super tasters have, and their taste perceptions are balanced, and it allows them to enjoy and appreciate different flavors without being overwhelmed by bitterness and spice. Non-tasters have a lower sensitivity to taste due to having fewer taste buds. Non-tasters experience flavors with less intensity, and they often find certain foods bland and others unflavorful. They can tolerate and even enjoy foods that others might perceive as bitter or overly spicy, and this is because a non-taster will have less of those taste buds. They might even eat raw kale or strong black coffee without finding it overly bitter. This it helps to understand how some people are more sensitive or less sensitive to intense flavors. Sensory interaction is a concept you should already be familiar with as it relates to sensation as a whole, but the College Board wants you to understand how this is unique to taste and smell as chemical senses. Taste buds on the tongue detect basic tastes, but much of what we perceive as taste comes from our sense of smell. When we eat, odor molecules travel to the olfactory receptors in the nose, and this enhance and complements our sense of taste. If the sense of smell is impaired, like when we have a cold, the flavor of food will be significantly diminished and we may only experience a basic taste sensation without the rich nuanced flavors that come with smell. This interaction shows how closely linked our senses of taste and smell are in our perception of flavor. Our next sensation is the sense of touch. The skin contains various sensory receptors that detect different forms of touch, such as a light touch, a stretching, pressure, vibration, and temperature changes. Temperature, like heat, is detected in the skin by specialized sensory receptors called thermoreceptors. These receptors are stimulated and they convert the touch into electrical signals through a process called transduction. These signals travel through the peripheral nerves to the brainstem and onto the thalamus, which relays that information to the somatosensory cortex, and that's located in the parietal lobe, which processes sensations. The somatosensory cortex interprets the type, intensity, and location of the touch, and it allows us to perceive it and react. This complex process enables us to feel and respond to our environment accurately and appropriately. Pain is detected by specialized nerve endings called nociceptors, which respond to potentially harmful stimuli like extreme heat, pressure, or chemicals. When these receptors are activated, they send signals through the spinal cord to the brain where the sensation of pain is processed and received. This helps to protect the body by signaling when something is wrong. The gate control theory explains how pain signals can be modulated in the spinal cord before reaching the brain. According to the gate control theory, the gate 
is in the spinal cord and can either allow or block pain signals from traveling to the brain. Factors like competing sensory signals, like rubbing the area, putting pressure on the area can influence the gate's status. For instance, focusing on the pain or being stressed can open the gate and increase the perception of the pain. But rather by putting pressure or cold or adding another um, touch sensation can open the gate to that particular touch sensation and close the gate to the pain, reducing the pain perception. This theory helps to explain why pain can vary widely among individuals and even the same person under different circumstances. We experience pain in different ways also because we can be influenced by various factors like biological factors such as genetic influences and our ability to relieve pain, as well as our social and cultural influences and our attitudes towards pain. We can also be influenced by psychological factors like stress and attention. So there are many factors that influence our perception of pain rather than just the intensity of the stimulus itself. One more concept related to pain in our touch sensation is the phantom limb sensation. And this is a fascinating example of how touch perception can continue even after a limb has been amputated. Individuals who lose a limb may still feel the sensations of pain from that missing limb, even though that limb is not there. And this is because the brain's sensory and motor areas have been mapped for that limb are remaining active. The primary somatosensory cortex in the parietal lobe retains a map of that lost limb, and that can lead to the sensation of touch, temperature, or even pain despite the absence of the limb. This phenomenon demonstrates how the brain's representation of the body parts can persist, and it reflects the complex interplay between our sensory perception and our neural plasticity. Our next sensation is our sense of balance. This is referred to as your vestibular sense, and it's actually detected inside of your inner ear. There is a looped structure that sits directly above the cochlea called the vestibular system or the semicircular canals, and this is responsible for detecting your sense of balance. The video animation I'm using to demonstrate your sense of balance in your vestibular system comes from the Nebraska Health and Medicine Library, and I think it gives you a great visual representation of how this system works. As you can see in the visual, the semicircular canals include three loop-like structures that are oriented in different planes horizontal, anterior, and posterior. This allows them to detect rotational movements. Inside of each canal is a fluid and tiny hair-like extensions called cilia. When the head moves, the fluid in the semicircular canals lags just slightly due to inertia, causing it to push against the hair cells, and the bending of the hair cells generates electrical signals through a process you know called transduction. The hair cells convert the movement into nerve impulses, which are transmitted through the vestibular nerve, through the brainstem, to the thalamus, and onto the cerebellum, where it's interpreting balance. This is the vestibular system. And finally, the kinesthetic sense, which refers to our awareness of our position and movement of our body. Because of your kinesthetic sense, you can move your body in space without having to look at your body parts. This sensation is detected by proprioceptors. These are located in your muscles, tendons, joints, and they provide information about muscle tension, joint position, and body movement. The signals from the proprioceptors travel through the sensory nerves, through the spinal column, and then to the brain. They are processed in several areas, including the cerebellum, which plays a crucial role in coordinating our movement and balance, and the somatosensory cortex, which integrates our sensory information to form a complete picture of where our body is positioned in space. You can test your kinesthetic sense by touching your nose with your eyes closed. So do this, extend your arm, one of your arms out straight in front of you with your index finger pointing. Close your eyes and bring your finger to touch the tip of your nose. Try it again by touching your opposite ear. How about your chin, your shoulder, your belly button? Could you do all of that with your eyes closed? I imagine that you could do that fairly accurately because of your spatial and bodily awareness that is your kinesthetic sense. 
So let's finish today's video with a few questions for review. Remember to pause the video after the question to determine the answer and check your answers at the end. Question number one says, Jamie felt intense pain when she broke her finger. According to the gate control theory, where are the gates located to enable Jamie's brain to perceive pain messages from her finger? Question number two says, Austin damaged the hair-like receptors in his semicircular canals. Which sensation will be most impacted? Question number three says, Dr. Hessler asked a group of participants with damage to their sensory systems to touch their noses with their eyes closed 10 times. He asked a group of participants without sensory system damage to engage in the same action. The median number of times the group with sensory system damage touched their nose was five times. The median number of times for the group without sensory system damage was 10 times. Which of the following is the likely variable of interest? Question number four says, which research method might be the best for conducting research on phantom limb sensations? This video concludes part five, the other sensory systems. Make sure that you're able to answer our key focus questions and define our essential concepts. Before closing out, check your answers to the multiple choice questions below.